James Hannington. Uh, James Hannington grew up in a very prosperous family. He was not landed gentry of England. His dad had actually made his fortune um, running a department store. And yet, they were a Christian family. And one of the things that happened was that when he was building his estate, he built a chapel on the estate. A place where they would go as a family to go and worship. Initially, James Hennington had been marked for a career in business similar to his father. But something began to happen to James and happen at a relatively early age while he was attending these family services of worship. A great argument to take your kids to church, by the way. And as a result, over a long period of time, he eventually wound up seeking ordination. What we don't know, even though he kept journals, he didn't start his journals until after he went to Africa, how that got him into the wilds of what was then called Central Equatorial Africa, what we think of as Uganda. And, and yet, he went down there, people came to Christ, uh, he was commissioned through a missionary agency in England that still exists, CMS, and um, went back to England and they made him a bishop. So he is in fact the first bishop of Central Equatorial Africa. But then he goes back and he's going back to sort of visit his cures, to see missionaries, as it were. And he and his crew are ambushed. He is with a group of about 50, actually, that are making their way through the bush to visit these various missionary outposts. Uh, he is attacked. Many of his group were killed on the spot. But even though he was beaten and mistreated, he was kept alive because he was, in fact, the trophy for the tribal king. I want to read... We have some of his journal, so I want to read his description. This is actually from the Church of England uh, website. He said, describing his attack, he said, Suddenly about 20 ruffians set upon us. They violently threw me to the ground and proceeded to strip me of all my valuables. Thinking that they were robbers, I shouted for help. But then they forced me up and hurried me away. And I thought, what are they going to do? They're going to throw me down a precipice. And I shouted again in spite of one threatening to kill me with a club. Twice I nearly broke away from them and then grew faint with struggling and they dragged me by the legs over the ground. And I said, Lord, I put myself in thy hands, I look to thee alone. Then another struggle, I got up to my feet but then was dashed again. More than once I was violently brought into contact with trees along the way, some trying in their haste to force me one way, some the other. And the exertion and struggling strained me in the most agonizing manner. And in spite of all of this, I laughed actually at the very agony of my situation. And I sang out loud, safe in the arms of Jesus. My clothes were torn to pieces so that I was exposed, wet through with being dragged on the ground, strained in every limb and for a whole hour expecting instantaneous death, pushed until we finally came to the encampment. And then he goes on to say, this is of course someone else, they found his journal, which is why we even have that much. He said, after exhibiting James Hannington as a trophy for a week, his tormentors eventually speared him to death on the 29th. Mm -hmm. uh, we know this because of one of Ugandans kept Hannington's journal and sold it later. His last recorded words, and this is quoted in the collect, Go tell your master that I have purchased the road to Uganda, meaning for Christians, with my blood. He died at the age of 38. I, as I think of him, as I think of Christians who to this day are killed for their faith, not only within the continent of Africa, but in many other places that we now know and in fact make the headline. It says something to me about what God thinks is important. That if we somehow think that the prosperity of God in our life is meant for us to live, in essence, a self-satisfying existence, 
we are profoundly mistaken. And that even the psalm that we read about turning my wailing into dancing could even in that place be read as an eternal promise, something that happens after we have taken off the sackcloth of death and put on the eternal garments of eternity. Certainly Paul says in the midst of this, who can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? He says rather cryptically but accurately, for your sake we are killed all the day long and we are treated as sheep for the slaughter. In other words, the promise of saying that nothing can separate us from the love of God is number one, neither esoteric, in fact, everything except for martyrdom, and he lists about clubs and nakedness and sword, all those things he had personally experienced. And he describes them within the context of his epistles, or we see or hear it acted out in the accounting of the book of Acts. So this is no someone who doesn't understand firsthand the experience of really much the worst that life has to offer. And if tradition is true, he was killed by the sword, the only thing that he isn't in that list that he had personally experienced at this writing by Nero when he made his way to Rome. In other words, to say that I will be protected by Christ doesn't mean that I will necessarily be shielded from adversity. But what it does mean is that nothing will stand in the way of me fulfilling the purpose of God. See, that's very, very different. Mm -hmm. And that God's, in essence, operating on his behalf in my life. That's different than saying God, operate, God operating on my behalf. No, God operating on his behalf in my life is to provide for me spiritually, physically, circumstantially, whatever is necessary for me to fulfill God's God-given purpose for my existence, that for which I was formed from before the foundations of the earth, that for which I have been appointed to live. It is, in fact, my charge in life. And while we say that in a very general way when we talk about missionary availability, God forges that in a unique way in and through each of us, but it is certainly for availability. It is for mission, and not merely for our own accumulation. That's what the martyrs tell me. That's what the martyrs caused me to see in the very plain text of Scripture, even in the Gospel reading. When some of the Pharisees some you need, say, you need to get out of town, have your parents going to kill you. He doesn't deter it. He said, no, 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 for this I was born. He understands very clearly, I must do the work that has been given to me to do. In other words, that's actually more important than me preserving my physical life. And that also is, in fact, a word to us that we're called to abandonment. And we're called, and this for us many is really quite scary, but true, we're called to be faithful, even at a very high price, trusting that Jesus will give us what we need to be able to, perhaps like James Hannington, sing aloud safe in the arms of Jesus as he was being dragged into captivity and eventually his death. I don't think we can anticipate that. I still remember a conversation that I read, I read actually within a little book called A Hiding Place about Corey Ten Boom, who was eventually killed in a concentration camp for hiding Jews during World War II. And it's recalled actually by her sister who survived. And they were trying to figure out when would God give us what we needed if we were to get arrested? Because they knew that what they were doing in Holland was illegal. And Corey looked at her younger sister and, and she said, when do we know it's time for us to get on the bus, meaning their public transportation? And she says, oh, when my father gives us the ticket. I think that's how it is. We don't know when the opportunity will arise, but the father will give us the ticket that we need to get on the bus 
that he asks of us. And when the ticket appears, we know that's God's opportunity in front of us. Prior to that, we don't have the ticket. We don't necessarily have what it takes to be able to step on the bus. But he does give us what we need, even though we can't imagine us now having the fortification necessary to sing in the face of death or to make whatever sacrifice for the sake of the gospel that God has called us to. It really is a trust that when the time comes, he will provide, even as now, in the midst of the circumstances in which we are, we're trusting that he is giving us what we need to live into, in that kind of missionary availability, this day, today, Thursday, that he has set before us in the midst of all the things that we'll encounter. That's, it seems to me, what makes sense in the light of the scripture. That God takes us by the hand and leads us, perhaps in the way that we would not choose to go, like was said of Peter. But that will God will each step of the way, give us what we need, and that no matter what we encounter, even the worst that life has to offer, nothing will be able to separate us from the love notice of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.